Hi everyone, welcome to the virtual Amicus and I'm Jail Udha. Well, arbitration is definitely one of the most effective and efficient remedies for settling of disputes among parties for two reasons. One, because it does not uh, require any le uh, lengthy procedure to follow and two, it takes relatively less time as compared to other judicial processes. But how does one draft an effective uh, arbitration clause? What is the scope of that arbitration clause? So what do you mean by seat of an arbitration? And what is the difference between an ad hoc and institutional arbitration? So today on our segment, we decided to say it takes, uh, seek some help from an expert in arbitration laws. She's a very renowned lawyer in the field of arbitration. So we have with us uh, Ms. Mahi Mehta. And just to give you all a brief background about Ms. Mehta, she is a law graduate from 2018 batch of uh, NMIMS which is School of Law, Mumbai in India. And it's a prime, and she's a primarily a dispute resolution lawyer. Since 2018, she has been associated with uh, Advani and Company, which is a boutique alternative uh, disputes law firm uh, led by Mr. Hiro Advani, a round, a round figure again in the field of arbitration. We all look up to him. In her professional pursuits, she has advised a, a range of private and corporate clients in relation to arbitrations in both domestic and international jurisdictions, including ad hoc as well as institutional arbitrations under the rules of ICC and SIAC. She has also advised various public sector enterprises as well as multinational corporations, primarily in the EPC, oil and gas, power, petroleum sectors. Her experience has also ranged across successfully advise, uh, advising on arbitrations and negotiations under the MSME Act of 2006 and the Lok Adalat Act of 1987. She has also authored a number of articles on contemporary issues in the field of arbitration, which have been published by renowned legal uh, content platforms. And she can very well be reached out. Her email ID is mahi, M-A-H-I dot M-E-H-T-A Mehta, mahi dot Mehta. 0227 at gmail.com. So she'll be sharing it again at the end of her or during the course of her presentation. I'll repeat mahi.mehta0227 at gmail.com. So thank you so much, Miss Mehta, for joining us, for taking out time from your busy schedule. So uh, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you for such an extensive introduction. I would rather thank you. I'm honored to be here speaking with all of you. And uh, I mean, I think it's a great initiative which you're doing right now in such trying times, helping people be positive and stay positive. That's great. I mean, all the best to you. Without any further delay, I'll start with my presentation on how to draft an effective arbitration clause. To briefly explain what is arbitration. So arbitration is out of the court settlement. Basically, two parties decide who the arbitrator is going to be and adjudicate the dispute in a timely manner. So that is the reason why parties offer arbitration and not go to the courts. Now, what are the principles on which arbitration is built on? See, in every commercial transactions between two parties, for example, if Jay and I in a, are in a commercial transaction, we will pen it down through a contract. We'll sign it, we'll decide all the terms and conditions of that contract. So while we are doing that, in every, for every commercial transaction, it's important that the parties have a dispute resolution clause and a settlement clause. I would first focus that why do we need a settlement clause in, a, in an arbitration agreement or in any agreement for that matter? See, be, there are various parties who don't want to opt for an arbitration or don't want to go to a trial. They would rather want to settle the dispute so that it gets settled like expeditely and parties do not hamper on their interest as well. So in order to do that, there should be a settlement clause. And if that doesn't fluctify or the, or if, and if the same fails, then parties must initiate or mention a dispute resolution clause. Now for a dispute resolution clause, the most preferred mode of dispute resolution in now times is arbitration. I already explained what arbitration is. It's out of the court settlement. But why do you think that parties are opting for arbitration nowadays? Why people think that arbitration is so much more better than the other uh, uh, dispute mechanisms which we have? So here, there are a few pros and cons about arbitrations. We first need to understand that the arbitration is built on the principle of 
party autonomy now what is party autonomy me and you anybody in an arbitration they are free they are they are at liberty to select the place of the arbitration to select the seat of the arbitration to select the person who is going to adjudicate the dispute such kind of freedom is given to the parties who wants to offer the dispute mechanism Gen generally arbitration is more preferred nowadays it's the most prevailing form of dispute mechanism right now because it it helps in speedy speedy disposal of matters matters get disposed of very speedily now there is a time frame you can even conclude your matter within a 6 months time 8 months time 12 months time you have all the figures in front of you that's why parties want to offer arbitration the only hiccup the parties face is it sometime involves very high cost with that comes to it but that's the same for any court litigation also because it goes on for years and you still have to ultimately spend that much of money so now while we are at it let's discuss why do we have to build an effective arbitration clause let me first explain you i've already told you the principle of party autonomy which is attached to an arbitration now once we are drafting an arbitration clause few things which it, which are very pertinent to remember is firstly the scope of arbitration while we are drafting the clause the scope of arbitration is so important because we can either narrow it down or broaden it up for example if we mention that any dispute arising of this particular contract would be arbitrable then we are narrowing the scope we can also say any dispute arising out of this agreement or any related agreement would also be arbitrable here we are uh, widening up the scope so it's on the parties again they are at liberty to decide the scope of the arbitration in any particular contract even of a buyer or a seller they can minimize the scope by mentioning okay any dispute with respect to the quantities would not be arbitrable and any dispute with respect to the late uh, delay in delivery etc would be arbitrable so it's on the parties to decide what the what they want the scope to be so it's very important here to determine the scope properly and let me also tell you the court has in various circumstances determined that what all determines to be the scope of arbitration the court has mentioned particularly in various judgments that any testamentary matter any divorce matter any property related matters they are they're not, not arbitrable like a party with any of the any of such problems for example if i have to file a divorce petition i have to go to the family court arbitration is not an option for me and that's a settled law the court has already given that but when you have the ball in your court while you are drafting an arbitration agreement in your specific contract you have the power to scope to determine the scope either to widen it up or to broaden or to narrow it down so and even in this respect i must tell you that even the arbitration act that totally uplifts the scope of the parties and whatever the parties have mutually decided the arbitration act in various sections itself has started with the four words if you see the four words are unless otherwise agreed between the parties so if there is something which has been already agreed between the parties for example we have agreed the scope of the arbitration then even the act can't do much even the even the things which are decided between the parties are at a higher footing than what the statute has to give you so that is how important the scope of an arbitration is and we are at full liberty to determine it as and where we want now coming on to the second most critical topic which is the seat of arbitration now when we talk about seat generally we think that okay it's the place where the arbitration is going to be conducted or it's the venue seat would be the same thing but no let me correct it let me correct you right now and here what is seat seat is basically the place where or is the jurisdiction of court which we are going to decide that if in case i have any relief any urgent relief if i want to enforce the award if, if i want to challenge the award then this is the remedy this is the court where i have to go to and this court would have the exclusive jurisdiction here i can't think of going to any other court because that's what the parties have decided that the seat of the arbitration would be such and such place so it's really important because see once we enter into once we invoke an arbitration 
parties time and again would want various reliefs they would want to appoint an arbitrator in case they fail to appoint one mutually they would want to enforce the award so it's important that we determine the seat then and there in the arbitration while we are drafting it because see if in case a party fails to determine the seat of the arbitration or they fail to mention it the seat of the arbitration then the law is very clear the law says when the seat is not mentioned the place would be considered as the seat of the arbitration now let me give you an example of this suppose i'm pretty sure that i want my seat of the arbitration would be delhi high court i'm very sure but i have failed to put that in my drafting agreement in the agreement which i have drafted now the place of the arbitration was mutually decided by the party is just the place where the hearings were to be conducted that was decided as london since i wanted the seat to be delhi high court but i failed to mention it now as per the law which is given by the supreme court i have to approach the london courts for any remedy which i would want because i have the remedy to do it but since i had failed to mention it in my arbitration agreement the seat that's what the repercussions we have to face so it's very important that we mention our seat because let me once again put it to you in case of any urgent reliefs appointment of arbitrators injunctions restraints etc we approach the seat of the arbitration so please make sure next time when you draft an arbitration clause that you mention the seat properly and do not confuse it with place because place is just a mere venue where you are conducting the arbitral hearings and you are not going forward with anything else you, that's not the law or that's not the court where you have to go for your to invoke your reliefs and remedies even the place and the seat has been very critically decided by the supreme court in various judgments uh, various different view is there but till now the settled view uh, by the case of bjs sjs soma is that if the place if the seat is not mentioned the place would be considered as the seat until or unless there is some contrary mention in the agreement itself if not then the place would be considered as the seat so in order to avoid such confusion such repercussions it's better we mention the seat properly in our arbitration agreement itself and so that we know that where to approach which court to approach in case we have any remedies in future now moving ahead to the rules governing the arbitration we have one substantive agreement in which we have the arbitration agreement enclosed so for that in our contract we need to mention that the substantive agreement the law governing the substantive agreement would be for example indian laws uk laws whatever laws we want to select we can choose that but make sure with substantive agreements the parties are at liberty to claim various other claims like damages laws etc damages laws etc so in order to invoke those remedies we need to mention what kind of law do we want here so we are at liberty even if we are in india but we think that a law in uk might support our position then we may put the claim that the law governing the substantive contract would be the laws of the united kingdom we can also mention that the laws governing our substantive contract would be laws of india so indian contract act indian specific relief act would come in pictures and you can arbitration one is the arbitration ad hoc arbitration and the other one is institutional arbitration while i'm talking about institutional arbitration there are rules which are governed by the parties so in, in institutional arbitrations parties are at liberty to select any of the institution around the globe or even in india there are institutions like international chambers of commerce that is icc there is singapore international arbitration center ciac in india we have a well known uh, institutional center as ncia so the parties are free to select the centers so this center would basically conduct the whole arbitration for the parties and would act as a link between the arbitrator and the parties so the the institution would take care of filing the claims when the parties have submitted it would would have their own panel of arbitrators you can select it from there you don't have to select it individually they would have a 
proper mechanism as to how to review the award, whether the award is reasoned or no. They they have a specific criteria. They have timelines. They have they take care of the cost mechanism. The parties won't come one to one as to please pay my cost, etc. There is a whole structure to an institutional arbitration, which the institution take cares of once you enroll through that mechanism. But if parties doesn't want to involve an institution to govern their arbitrations, we have an option to go for ad hoc arbitrations. Now, in an ad hoc arbitration, the parties select their own arbitrator, which they jointly want to select. They choose their own place, venue, etc. Everything is done by them. But there is no definite structure. There is no timeline to it. I mean, just to ex just to give you an example, for suppose if I and the arbitrator is there at the hearing and there is no institution involved, so generally it happens that if I may have a difficulty, then arbitrator adjusts to that. And if he's got something and he can't adhere to the dates which have been fixed, he adjourns the hearings and the parties fix new days. Dates. So sometimes these issues, these small issues, take a lot of time, and you're not able to adhere to the timeline of the 12 months. However, the Act do provides for extension of your arbitration time, but that's not the purpose here because the purpose of speedy remedy is not getting solved here by just giving mere extensions. So that way, if the amount is the, uh, the claim amount is bigger, then I would definitely suggest for you to go for an institutional arbitration. Because institutional arbitration also give you also gives you remedies like emergency arbitrations. If you have an urgent relief, you can probably get it solved in within 30 days. I mean, that's the kind of relief they, they have to offer you. Emergency arbitration is there. If an arbitrator completes your whole adjudication within the time span or before the time span, then he get, then he gets a ranking to it he gets rewards to it. That's not the case in an ad hoc arbitration. The arbitrator would resolve the matter, but at his own sweet will, and he would check his calendar before checking your own dates. So that's the kind of remedy that's available under institutional arbitration. Uh, safe to say institutional arbitration is a pretty, it's, it's, it's a bit heavy on pockets, but if you have bigger claims, then I'm sure that you could go for an institutional arbitration and get your matter sorted as soon as possible. So these are the two kinds of arbitrations, ad hoc and institutional arbitrations, which are there. And we can very well choose the, the route we, which we want to take. For example, if we I want to go for an institutional arbitration, so in our dispute resolution clause, we can mention that the arbitration would be governed by the rules of MCIA, which is the Mumbai International Center. So that is clear and specific. Now the other party can't argue that we want to go for an ad hoc arbitration because that's what not we have agreed to. We have agreed to an institutional arbitration. So even that has to be mentioned clearly. The laws which you want the agreement to be, the agreement to follow and the rules which you want the agreement to follow. So these two things has to be very clear while you're drafting your arbitration clause. Now let me come to one more important factor that is number of arbitrators. I think we all know that the counting of the arbitrator is always an odd number. Either it can be one or it can be three. So it has to be odd to ensure that there is an impartial award, impartial judgment in favor of the parties. So here, what we have to consider, there is a very important point which has been, I mean, ignored as of now. And thankfully now the courts have ruled on it. That is all the major government companies which are there in India at the moment. They put a dispute resolution clause for the arbitrators be as uh, that the in case of any dispute, the parties, the arbitration would be decided by any retired employee of the organization or any employee officers who were working with the organization before. So these kind of clauses, we really need to now st start objecting to these kind of clauses because even they have been rendered illegal by the Supreme Court itself through the Perkins judgment. So such clauses should be objected to from the first moment because the government companies, they still put such clauses that their retired employees and their officers would be determined, would determine the arbitral tribunal, which is totally unfair. And they would obviously determine the award in favor of the party or the company which they are representing. So there never, there would never be an 
independent or an impartial award in favor of the parties so that would really i mean defeat the purpose of the arbitration altogether so this has been rightly pointed out by the supreme court in the perkins judgment and now th such clauses have been thankfully rendered illegal so even we should be aware that while we are drafting an arbitration clause any such clause with any of the government company should be denied then and there so these are a few pointers which you need to keep in mind while you're drafting an arbitration clause and last is the place of the arbitration i have already mentioned that place is just a venue where you go and conduct the and conduct the virtual hearings or the physical hearings now what has happened due to the covid situation which we all are facing right now there are only virtual hearings so there no place of arbitration there is, we don't have to decide any place because everyone sitting at their home and just doing it through zoom or microsoft teams etc but generally before this the, the 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 place was to be determined specifically and it was just the place where the hearings were to be con uh, uh, conducted it was never to be confused with the seat of the arbitration the seat of the arbitration would be the jurisdiction of the court where the parties will go so i hope that it's very clear that what the seat and what the place is and now from now onwards we wouldn't never confuse our while we are drafting an arbitration clause with respect to what the what the seat is and what the place is so these are the various pointers which we actually need to remember while we are drafting an arbitration clause and to ensure that a effective remedy is been rendered through this mostly and the fact like while we are drafting an arbitration clause it's always preferred that we use words like shall and and like refrain from using words like may because again words like may again give the power to the other party to interpret it differently so it's better not to leave any co confusion at all we make sure that the arbitration clause is very plain simple and un unambiguous and in order to make it unambiguous it's important that we mention we give that effective value to the clauses by saying shall and not use words like may and i'm pretty sure if we remember the scope of arbitration like i told you the seat of arbitration the rule governing laws and the rules governing the arbitration we can totally make an a uh, positive arbitration clause out of that which would be plain clear and unambiguous and we could all interpret it properly so by this i would also like to mention that once we have an effective arbitration clause in place we would know what where, which place to go to which court to go to in case we have any remedies to the arbitration because once arbitration award is passed the parties do go for enforcement do challenge the award so we now know that we have to go to the seat of the arbitration to either challenge the award or to enforce the award the reason why arbitration is a preferred mode of medium again is that there are a timely structured involved and even the government and the legislature judiciary etc they're taking a pro arbitration stance every now and then all the judgments which are coming in they ensure that a timeline is there to arbitration so that even the burden on the judiciary is is relatively lower we lower down the burden on the judiciary and we help parties settle their disputes to arbitration so that even parties get a timely and a the fast track speedy recovery of the disputes and they also get whatever they desire for through arbitration and in case they have any remedy from the arbitration then they can specifically approach the courts but in order to avoid that in order to avoid the burden on the judiciary people have started now opting for arbitration it's the most preferred dispute resolution mechanism out there i mean now people don't even call it alternative dispute mechanism they call it parallel dispute mechanism because it goes parallel to the courts there are now like major claims which are going for arbitrations and i think getting effectively solved and everyone's like everyone's rights and interest have been taken care of through arbitration mechanism and like the principles of party autonomy severability etc are all fulfilled by just invoking arbitration since the parties are at liberty to select the place the seat the arbitrator they want to it's all taken care of through arbitration and lastly i mean in case of any remedy obviously as i likely said that the parties are free to go to the courts but in order to decrease the timeline to get speedy remedies we prefer arbitration as the ultimate as the alternative dispute mechanism and we approach 
the arbitrator to resolve our disputes. So I think all in all, this was my presentation on how to draft an effective arbitration clause and why arbitration is a better mechanism as a speedy mechanism to that litigation. And uh, I would take this opportunity to again, once again, thank Jay for giving me this opportunity and actually uh, speak about the topic which I got on drafting an effective arbitration clause. Hope you all like it. If you have any queries, please reach out to me. Please feel free. And I would be happy to help you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay, once again. Thank you so much, Ms. Mehta, for taking our time from your busy schedule. I hope our viewers have understood by now why is it so important to consult an arbitration attorney in arbitration matters. Otherwise, you will end up mixing both venue and seat and you will give it the same meaning as most of us generally and ordinarily do. So uh, thank you so much, Ms. Mehta, as a, a prolific writer and a prolific uh, speaker for taking out time once again. Thank you so much, everybody, for your patient hearing. And stay tuned. Uh, next episode is on its way. And please like, subscribe, and share my channel. Stay home, stay indoors. And thank you so much, Ms. Mehta, once again for your time. Thank you so much, everybody. And we'll see you super soon. Thank you so much once again.